Outdoor Drive Podcast. All right. Welcome back to the Outdoor Drive Podcast. This is episode 145, right? Is that right? 145? You're right, brother. Oh, man. 144 was last week and 145 is this week. Could you imagine? I guess that would make uh, 146 next week. Yeah, that's pretty good. Hey, that's good math. Good, Pretty good for a bunch of rednecks. Yeah, hey, if you can figure that out, I don't know what else you can figure out. <laughs> but we'll find out sooner than later. But this is this is your boy, East Coast Trev, and... This is Steve. What's up, Steve? I guess, you know, <laughs> we need to change, or I need to change the way that I go into the intro, because it's all the same. <laughs> it's a standard, Always. though. Can, People have got to just know like, it. Oh, okay, sorry. You, you change it, you're going to screw them up. They're going to think something's wrong. That's like Manish. Remember that when Manish was talking about it? So like it's like a normal thing. Remember him? Yeah. Manish? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait to have him on. Oh, we got to get that kind of figured out because I really want to have him on the podcast, but being overseas, yeah, the time's the time a little bit different. It really so, is difficult. He would be recording at like midnight our time. Yeah, we'd, so have, it'd be a little... we'd have to set that up so we're recording like either early morning or midday yeah it's not all that behind but anyways it's all good um you guys one thing i do want to tell everybody just i want you to pause the podcast real quick go and grab a notebook and pen you're definitely going to need it for this podcast uh we have on jake bush what a phenomenal phenomenal gentleman uh and an absolute killer in the early season and you know we had brought up kind of in this podcast kind of how important it is to kind of talk about this stuff now so go and get your notebook get your pen and paper because you're definitely going to need it for this podcast um it's just it's it's a great podcast i was i was kind of drugged right into it i was i was just i was taking mental notes but i'm gonna have to go back and kind of write everything down and kind of well, use it to my advantage spend so much time talking about you know how do you prepare for the rut and the high activity and the cold weather and you know that peak quit essential deer season and he's going no i'm first day down type hunting i want this thing done day one right and a lot of people like we talk about on the show you know they're just getting geared up when early season kicks off except for the diehards you know i it's it's good to have this refreshed light on the early season it's a it's a true it's a true example of what 365 days a year deer season is really about in Absolutely. all, in all actuality. What, you know, we talk about that the, the first day of deer season starts after the last day of the previous season. And this is, this is, absolutely 100% the reason why. And Jake shows you, I mean, especially shooting booners um, in the first week of the season. I mean, like, those deer don't move, remember? It's and, too hot. And it's not a once or twice coincidence. That's every season for him. That's his goal. And he, he nails it down. He does it. It's good does information. It. Absolutely. Well, let's get to some housekeeping. Enough of us talking about it. We'll get over to him here shortly. Um, let's, uh, we'll, we'll, we will do the uh, sponsors. And just uh, those guys are just amazing. They're good people. Do you agree? Yeah, just do okay. it then. <laughs> just do it then. Uh, Huntworth, huntworthgear.com. If you guys haven't chunked out Huntworth, we are working on a promotional code. Uh, that should hopefully be here soon. Uh, things have been a little bit crazy for all of us with uh, normal life. So we'll get the that working out for you guys. We have used it on the early season stuff. It is absolutely phenomenal. I talk about it every episode, but it really, truly, honestly is great camouflage um it's warm when you need it to be warm and cool when you need it to be cool it's what what is it actually called when you have the three layers jake had actually talked about it in the podcast yeah yeah when you use the merino wool setup and the whole merino that's it and yeah uh, but the way this stuff is built guys the best way i can put it to you is it is sitka without the price agreed 100 100 the gloves are phenomenal they're known for the yeah, gloves. Yeah, I've, I've never had a brand of camo gloves that didn't tear the first hunt. Yeah. And all turkey season didn't have a single issue. So props to that. Absolutely. Bowfishing Magazine, bowfishingmagazine.com. Guys, if you're not a bow fisherman, want to be a bow fisherman, or want to know about bow fishing, probably a good place for you to go and check or out. Or want to be bow fisherman. Or want to be bow fisherman. <laughs> uh, there's some really good recipes on there. 
Uh, there's some really good stuff. It's a virtual online thing. You can sign up for that. Check that out. Uh, Nick Sampson over at Bowfishing Magazine has a new boat, so there's a lot of cool things to check out there. <laughs> she not She's fat. Kinda... She juicy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it. We're going to go down and shoot some fish on that. Uh, Nor'easter, uh, Game Calls, nor'eastergamecalls.com. Mr. Mark Buzzle uh, doing some phenomenal stuff over there. He's building some great stuff. We're working on actually a new call, uh, Grunt Tube. You guys have been asking for it, the demand, so it's going to be met here soon, and you guys will see that. So we have the Jurassic Series coming out soon and some other ones, but we're kind of getting back to the drawing board and tweaking those things. So keep your eye out on that. If you guys haven't already, get on over to NorEasterGameCalls.com. And we're also partnered with Latitude Outdoors, LatitudeOutdoors.com. If you guys are in the saddle game or mobile game, some really cool things coming out from those guys. We're going to have those guys on the podcast at the end of the month so you guys can kind of hear a little bit more about them but and a very good thing to do now is practice with your gear um get your gear now don't wait for a week before season especially if you're getting into the mobile game hunting um so get on over there order your stuff the stuff that you want and learn your climb uh, definitely build your climb there's no doubt about it um I'll give you a little tidbit. Next week, we're having on Vital Grounds, Matt Chola, um, on the podcast to go through all of mobile hunting um, at its finest from from X to Y, from beginning to end, straight up, so you guys can really hear about it, and then you guys can get your gear and go on from there. Uh, Zeus Broadheads, newerarchery.com. They are the home of the Zeus Broadheads, the Aries. Um, there is a new one coming out. I won't talk about that. Uh, B16 and Steady Form. If you guys haven't checked those guys out, please go and do so. You will not regret using those broadheads. The Zeus broadhead is probably one of the sickest broadheads on the market, hands down. Um, I know everybody kind of has their own niche thing. Give them a shot, check them out, and see what they're all about. Uh, so that's newerarchery.com. Bing, boom, bang. Nailed it. We have now swept the floors, and we can move on. Can we, though? <laughs> Yeah, we kind of have to. Well, yeah, but, you know, we, we get hung up every time we get into this spot, and then there's all this dadgum fake news we got to hear about. Bringing you the news for the crews is our good buddy Mike Salter. Take it away, Mike. Hey everyone, let's start this one off in Washington, where the Department of Fish and Wildlife is taking comments on a new proposal to allow hunters to take a second mountain lion in areas where monitoring has shown a high level of predation on elk calves in the Blue Mountain elk herd. A study last spring showed only 9 out of 125 calves made it through the winter, with 77 of those deaths attributed to predation mostly from lions. Under the proposal, hunters would be allowed to take a second lion in population unit management units 9, 10, 11, which encompasses game management units 145, 149, 154, 162, 163, 166, 169, 172, 175, 178, 181, and 186. A uh, second transport tag would be required uh, if a second line is taken by a hunter. Comments are being accepted through June 25th via a link on the Fish and Wildlife's input page or via email to 2022 Cougar Season CR102 at publicinput.com uh, or by mail to the Fish and Wildlife's Wildlife Program. Now to West Virginia, where new legislation has been signed to allow air guns for hunting small game and big game during the regular firearm season, provided that county-specific regulations do not prohibit firearms for deer hunting. The change prohibits the use of air rifles during muzzleloader and mountaineer heritage seasons, uh, and arrow shooting air rifles are prohibited for both small game and big game hunting. Air rifles used for big game must be a minimum of 45 caliber and use at least a 200 grain bullet. Turkey hunting and small game require the use of a minimum of a 22 caliber. Uh, and all air rifle hunters are held to all of their firearm hunting regulations. Uh, and air rifles may not be discharged within 500 feet of a dwelling. Uh, to Florida and some more uh, information on air guns. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Commission has approved the use of arrow shooting air guns for taking of alligators. Uh, the only requirements are that the air gun be a pre-charged pneumatic and that the arrow be tethered to a restraining line to allow recovery of the alligator. 
The commission will be working on incorporating this change into the 2022 alligator season regulations. Now to Montana, where anyone looking to start trapping uh, will now be required to take a trapper education course. This new course will be required for anyone who wants to trap that has not been a licensed trapper for at least the last three previous, or for at least three previous seasons. The course is available online, but will also require, require a field day. Uh, two of those field days have already been scheduled for July with more dates to be scheduled in the coming weeks. Now to Arkansas, where the Game and Fish Commission has approved regulation changes for the upcoming seasons. First, the daily bag limit for white-fronted geese has been increased from two to three geese per day. Also, non-toxic shot will now be required for all migratory bird hunting on all Game and Fish Commission WMAs that have waterfowl access restrictions. Uh, there have also been some changes to the black bear seasons. A season has been added uh, for black bears in zones three and four with season dates of December 10th through the 16th and with a five bear quota for zone three and a 25 bear quota for zone four. Uh, and archery season for bears has been expanded in zones one and two, opening the weekend before archery deer season. Now, lastly, to Mississippi, where hunters will now have the opportunity to harvest velvet whitetails uh, during the state's first early archery hunt in September. The season has been set for September 16th to the 18th. During this early season, longbows, recurves, compounds, and crossbows may be used with no minimum arrow length and no minimum or maximum draw weight, and fixed or mechanical broadheads may be used. Uh, during this season, only legal bucks for the respective deer management unit may be harvested. Uh, and the bag limit is one legal buck, which counts toward the annual antler deer bag limit. Uh, hunters must also report the harvest by 10 p.m. on the day of the harvest. All hunters, unless exempt or have a life, lifetime license, must possess a valid velvet season permit, which is $10 for residents and is included in the $50 deer permit for non-residents. Uh, and all harvested bucks must be submitted for CWD testing to a MDWFP CWD drop-off freezer or to a participating taxidermist within five days of the harvest. Uh, this season is also for private land only. The department does have discretion to open the early season on WMAs, but will not do that for this year. Uh, but they are looking at the possibility of doing it for coming years. So a lot of good stuff there, a lot of opportunities. As always, if you have any news, feel free to send it along. Reach out to me at Mike Salter on Facebook or Beard underscore Bowhunter21 on Instagram. And with that, enjoy the rest of your ride. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate you, buddy. We're just busting on you. We appreciate the news that you do every week. Guys, if you guys have some news from a different state, I know that we're going into summer, a lot of fishing regulations, a lot of new things coming out and things kind of going on, new laws being proposed for different states. And the elections right around the corner. We know how that is, but we won't go there. But send your news <laughs> over to uh, Mike Salter, um, or you can send it to us, and we'll get you in contact with him. So definitely. Well, man, why don't we get to Jake? He's like, I think he's, he's ready going to, to hear go. something uh, worthwhile. Yeah. So get those pens ready. Lick the tips. Your ink on your fifth. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> in your fifth feather, and uh, let's go, Christopher Columbus. <laughs> Here we go. All right. We're back on the phone with Jake Bush, man. How are you, brother? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Hey, thanks for taking the time. I know you're a busy man, so <laughs> and these take up a little bit of time. Oh, yeah. No problem at all. I like talking deer hunting, so that works. Yeah, being a de deer killer, <laughs> I would like talking about it, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's that important part of the year where, you know, you're getting your plans laid out in hopes for that early season kill so it's kind of hard to walk away from the field right now oh yeah yeah there's a lot of time out there right now that and balancing uh family life you know i just got back from new york seeing family today actually so i get back work on some trail cameras get ready to put some cameras out and you know the process never ends well before we get too crazy man let's turn this key we'll put this thing into overdrive um and uh why don't you tell everybody who you are, where you're from, and a little bit about what you do? Yep. So I'm Jake Bush. I am originally from southwestern New York. I picked up my first bow at three years old, and I've been shooting bow and chasing animals around the woods ever since, it seems like. Uh, grew up, you know, small game hunting that evolved into glassing for deer and videotaping deer and going with my grandpa and my dad and watching them hunt and the way they hunted and the way that I wanted to do things a little bit differently growing up. And then, uh, when I was old enough, I got out there with my own bow and, uh, actually day one of 
of my bow hunting career, I shot a really good buck. So it started <laughs> off, <laughs> it started off pretty good for me. And, uh, you know, that got me hooked. That was a, it was a bigger deer than the average for the area. And I definitely dumb locked into it. There's no doubt about that, but I think killing that bigger deer kind of just like sent me down a path of, you know, I really like doing that. That's something that I enjoy. So yeah, you know, I joined the service, uh, right out of high school. And then I moved back to New York after that, after four years and, um, bought like my own little 30 acres. And I, I thought that I wanted to play the management game a little bit and the food plot game. And I became bored after about a year of that and decided to start hunting public again and, you know, chasing deer around and being adventurous. And, uh, my grandpa passed away and the stars kind of, you know, just aligned for me after that. And I realized I want to go chase this while I have time. So I, uh, quit my job, sold my house and moved to Southern Ohio. And I've been down here for three years now, three years in seven days, actually. So Jeez, it's been man. congratulations. Yeah. yeah I appreciate thank it. you for your service as well. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. What, uh, what branch were you at? Were you in air force? I was in the air force. Okay. So you yep. were a smart guy. <laughs> well, I spent three years in a hole 80 feet underground. So I don't know if I consider myself smart or not, but it's, it's a lot better than the sand in the middle East. I'll tell you. Yeah, that. you're right. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. <laughs> so, so what, what really made you want to move from New York to, to, to the Midwest? So really it was a matter of chasing uh, higher class deer. Like that's something that, you know, growing up in New York, you watch like these unattainable like shows on, on the outdoor channel, or you're looking in these magazines and you just see all of these giant bucks getting killed all over the place. And it's like, I don't, in New York, it's a lot of fun. You know, I, I like going up there. I like hunting with my family still. I like doing that. And like the whole tradition side of it, but you just, you're never going to have an opportunity to like consistently chase world-class deer. It's just not going to happen unless you have like the most primo piece of, of farmland which if you do that's awesome like congratulations but uh so i decided you know i just wanted to chase bigger deer and i kind of set my goal of a few states in the midwest you know i was like I, i'm comfortable going to wisconsin i'm com comfortable going to illinois iowa ohio and i just started applying for jobs to all those different states and uh I told myself i was gonna base the state i go to based on the job that gave me the most amount of time to be able to hunt and still support myself and i found a job in columbus ohio working 12-hour night shifts you know two on two off two on three off three on two off and i was like there there you go you got half the days off like yeah you're gonna have to swing back to days to go scout and stuff but you've got half the days off and then if you can squeeze a little bit of time in on your work days you, well, you're right where you need to be so that's exactly what I did. I came down to Ohio and, uh, yeah, that's what started it. That's awesome, man. And so what was kind of some of the, the trials and tributaries that you kind of went through to try and focus on what you wanted to do? Because obviously you went down there with like a little, little bit of know-how. Yeah, it was, uh, the, the whole experience was tough for me, you know, like even as far as like leaving family, you know, I left, family behind i just moved out of my dream home in new york into a 600 square foot apartment like an upstairs apartment um you know i just full send i just went full send for it and hope that my that you know i'd swim basically um but really it was the the terrain down here for the most part is very similar to what i was hunting up there you know i was on the edge of the uh allegheny mountains and so I was used to like the mountainous hilly terrain that would dump down into like agriculture. And that's just what I grew up doing. So it made a lot of sense to me. Uh, you know, before I moved down here quite a few years back, I learned about like wind-based bedding and Dan infall and the beast tactics and all of that. And that really started to get things clicking up there to the point where I was consistently killing my, the deer I was after in the first day or two of season. Um, and I was just like, yeah, I'm, I'm ready for something different. And so coming down here, yeah, terrain was pretty much the same. It was a matter of, at the time, I thought I was going to have to steer a lot of pressure. Uh, it turns out that there's not a ton of pressure early season down here. Um, but yeah, it was just a matter of really putting boots on the ground and trying to find deer that I was happy with pursuing, which happened right away. You know, I put, I think when I moved down here, I had three or four cameras. I put those cameras out and I had, when I went and checked them, I had like a a ton of 140, 150 inch deer. I'm talking in the teens with four cameras. Like it was Jeez. unbelievable. And coming from New York, like that's a giant buck for me. Right. Well, 
three years down the road, two booners later, it's like, okay, well now I've raised my, Next you know, my, 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 yeah, I've stepped up a little bit and, uh, now it's more difficult. So I would say that I find myself having to scout harder now and try to like locate a deer. The hard part for me isn't locating bucks or even mature bucks. It's locating that one or two deer that might be around that are in that upper tier class. You know, beginning of season last year, I only had one of those. And I, you know, I happened to get a bead on him and kill them. But I'd like to have three or four of those deer every year. That way I have more opportunity, which is why I'm running, you know, 60 cameras and I'm putting in uh, 150 or so days a year and, you know, three, 400 miles boots on the ground. I'm trying to just find a deer to kill is basically the hardest part for me at this point. That's nuts. And you normally pursue them early season. That's like your go-to thing. Yeah. So everything I'm doing is, you know, from the time I kill through the winter, through the spring, through the e-scouting, through the boots on the ground, through the trail cameras, through checking them in September, through glassing, locating specific food sources near the bedding that I found in the spring. All I'm trying to do is get a bead on the biggest buck I have day one. Like I, I go into day one, Everybody asks me my goals, right? What's your goal for the year? My goal is to kill the biggest deer that I find the first time that I hunt. And chances are I'm going to fail. Chances are that it's not going to happen, but that's my thought process and my mentality. And I work as hard as I possibly can to try to achieve that. And so even if it doesn't happen, normally I'm pretty close and I can work off of that. And then, you know, like within a week or within two weeks, hopefully I can get it done on that deer. So what, what, what really puts you in that area to get on that one deer that you're trying to get on that first day? So it's a, so it starts out with e-scouting, right? And I'm basically picking out in hill country, um, leeward ridges, but leeward ridges that have a lot of topography and a lot of terrain features, preferably with what I call a hub. You guys have probably heard me talk about like thermal hubs before, but basically, you know, the spokes of a tire, how they meet in the center, you'll have, four or five ridges that dump down into a bottom and that'll create a big hub. And generally there's a scrape down there that the deer are hitting at night. So what I'll do is I'll go around and I'll locate as many of those as possible that have a, is obvious of a food source and as far away from pressure that I think is possible. The biggest chunk of land that I can find, you know, unbroken land. And I'll go in and I'll put cameras in those hubs and that's how I'm getting inventory of these deer. So, you know, I might, I might find, like, a, you know, over the last couple of years, 20, 30, 40 of these hubs that I've really focused on. And maybe only one of them has a deer that I'm after, but I get a picture of that deer and a beat on him based off of that trail camera inventory. Unless I find his antlers, you know, if I find his antlers, that's a little bit different. I know he's there. I can run cameras in the area and try to find him. And I can do more scouting in that area because I know that he already exists. You know, and so basically what are, the point I'm at now, after a few years of being down here, is I want five primary areas to really focus on every year. And my goal is to upgrade those areas to the best five possible. So I'm going to continue to put the same amount of work in every year in different spots, you know, shed hunting hard, running a ton of cameras, trying to just say, okay, you know, come June, I've got five spots that I'm going to run 10 cameras. And that's, and I'm going to just dissect these pieces and know absolutely everything I can about every deer in there and how they move, how they, you know, go through the terrain, what food sources they're preferring at what time of year, what food sources are hot or not based on all that Intel. And that's how I'm going to piece it together. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really about trying not to spread yourself too thin, but broadcasting enough to where you have options as well, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So then you're just working off of those five areas and then trying to pinpoint where the active food source is for that, for say opening day. And then you're moving into, are you hunting more of the food source or more off their bed? Like where, where are you trying to be on that first day? So that's where it gets tricky. You know, it's going to, there's, there's a lot of factors that go into that. So say that I have a buck that's bedded on an Eastern facing point of a hub. So there's five points total, right? He's got two bedding locations for a Southern based wind. He's got one for an Eastern based wind, and he's got two for like a Northern based wind. If you, you know, make a C with your hand, you can imagine the ridges and then where the C is open, that's where the Creek would be draining out. I like to have that Creek running the way that the wind generally blows. So it, in my case, generally it's either East or North, you know, it's blowing from the South or from the West down here. 
And what I'll do is I'll try to determine what bed I think he's going to be in on a specific day. Um, you know, I'll have all the beds in the area scouted. I'll go in in September and I'll pull my cameras and I'll see like where I had him the most, you know, what direction he was coming from. I'll correlate every trail camera picture that I get to wind direction, to weather, to uh, active food sources at the time. And when I have that image, while I'm in there in September pulling those cameras, I'm also looking for secondary food sources. So I've already scouted the beds. I've already laid in the beds and pulled hair out of them. Now I'm looking, okay, you know, there's a bed on the point of that ridge or off the point of that ridge. I know that the hub scrape is 150 yards from his bed. Is there a food source in between his bed and the, and the hub scrape that I have to get to to target him? Or will he make it to this hub scrape in, in daylight and I can kill him right here? And then you can get even deeper into it where if he has more bedding points for a specific wind, maybe you sit back further by the hub scrape because you're not 100% positive he's in a specific bed. Maybe he's in like three beds and you don't want to be wrong. So I'm using all that to my advantage. I'm taking all that intel. And then when I go in to kill him on the day I want to kill him with the right wind, with the right conditions, I'll access in and I'll scout my way in and I'm looking for active food sources. So last year, for example, I walked in, I knew where the hub scrape already was. I had the deer on camera a week and a half before I killed him in that hub scrape. And I knew that that white oak flat was hot because I had a couple pictures of him. And I, I, when I was in there, there was acorns dropping. So there's a, pro, there's a private cornfield like a mile and a half away that was his destination of the night, his destination food source. But he's probably getting there at midnight. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to hunt either the hub scrape or the closest oak tree to his bed, which just so happened to be the same spot with that deer, which is why he ended up getting killed because he, he showed a weakness and I exposed it and I, you know, I made a play off that. But uh, yeah, I would, I would say that generally I'm hunting as close to the bed as, as I need to be. You know, I get, I get deemed a bed hunter, but I, I feel like I'm more of an opportunist where if there's a private ag or a public ag field and the, uh, and a, 170 inch deers coming out on that ag field every night, I'm going to sit right on the ag field. But mm -hmm. if I need to sit on the scrape, I'll sit on the scrape. If I need to sit on the food source 50 yards from his bed because he gets hung up on that food source, well, that's where I'm going to be. You know, it's, I want to be as aggressive as I need to be, but I want to have the intel to go as far as I need to. I mean, I'm talking right over top of his bed if I have to. Like I want, you know, in the, in the game of chess, you want to know every move. You want to know your, your opponent's moves before they make them and every possible move they can make so you can predetermine and preplan what you want to do and then, you know, make that surgical move, and that's kind of my, my plan. So you're just – you're going in and, and like you said, his weakness is your game because you're trying to see where he's going to be, whether, whether he's going to travel 1,000 yards to an ag field or he's going to stop at – your your hub scrape now is that hub scrape what you would call like would be like a like a, a a full year scrape where they're constantly a big communal scrape is that what you're trying to find to yes to get that inventory on them constantly yes exactly so the best ones that i'm finding the areas that i really focus on are areas where they don't even shift you know i do have some spots picked out that there's a there's a summertime shift from like an ag field back into the hardwoods but the best spots, the spots that I have the best amount of success are where they're at year round. So they're going to have the cover they need. They're, it's going to be a lack of pressure. They're going to have plenty of different food sources, you know, a variety of greens. They're going to have a, maybe a clear cut. They're going to have maybe some private ag nearby. They're going to have some good white oak flats. Like I'm trying to get a variety of food in that area to hold them there because that's helping me pattern that deer. So even patterns that I'm gaining on deer from finding their sheds in the spots like that, I've killed deer based off of finding an antler. And a lot of people think that that's a myth, but if you find the right spot where they're at all year round and they don't leave their beds and they're, you know, they're in generally the same area, you can use that to play to your advantage. And I think that people sometimes get it wrong where they're in their winter area or their summer area. And then if you find their shed, they're in their winter area, but if they're not leaving like you're saying, if they're not leaving that general vicinity, if the food, the water and everything that they need is there, then why would they leave that area? Exactly. And so, you know, don't get me wrong. There's definitely spots out there where deer are shifting a long ways in the wintertime, especially like up in the Northern States. You know, if you get 
two or three feet of snow in hardwoods, chances are they're going to go find something else to eat, whether it's green briars or whether it's a standing ag field somewhere. They'll, they'll migrate, I mean, miles and miles to get out of there. But yeah, if you're in the right spot and you have everything that they need, I mean, don't overthink it. You know what I mean? That's exactly what I try not to do. And you can do that research off of finding that shed and see if he do, it, it, he is hanging around there. If not, he might leave there in the spring and go somewhere else from where he's finding that shed. Yeah, and that's so that's where finding these bigger blocks of timber has helped me because I'm, you know, I have room to play. I have room to find that deer again. And that's like, okay, we find a shed and well, he's not going to be here. You know, this doesn't make sense. This is a south facing clear cut, but there's no uh, bedding for a south wind here. You know, it's only north wind bedding, sunshine, hillside bedding. Where, where's he going to be? And so I look on the map, I'm like, well, there's a really good hub with a lot of topography a mile and a half away that sets up really good for a west wind. Oh, you know what? It's got a private ag field a, a half mile from there. Like, I bet you that's where that deer is summering and spending his fall, but he's just reverting back in here on the south facing clear cut during the winter time. So I'll, I'll make a bead on that. You know, I'll take an educated guess and I'll go into that other spot and try to find what I need in there too. And so when you're trying to find those beds, because a lot of people, I guess there's a lot of mis misinterpretation on like where deer would bed, like what, what is the best thing that you could describe to somebody so that they have somewhere to look for some type of bed? To, you know, because everyone would be like, oh, yeah, that buck's bedded on this point or on this point or this buck's doing this. But nobody, you know, it's kind of like kind of a guess, you know what I'm saying? And you have to go there and check. But how would somebody that's kind of newer to it try to figure out where that bed is? So it depends on your, like, region, first off. You know, there's there's so many different types of bedding and different ways that they can bed. And there's no like 100% definitive, this is the way they do it. Um, you'll find what works for you over doing it. You know, like if, if you just continue to go out and you continue to find beds and you continue to learn, you're going to find what, you know, what you find, what you're comfortable with and what you're confident in. And you're just going to kind of focus on that. So for me, what I've learned, you know, from a couple of different guys that really are good in hill country over time was like the leeward thing, for example, or the topography, you know, I've heard a lot of guys talk about putting topography together. And so when I first learned, I was like, okay, well, I want to go do that. Right. Then I'd go put boots on the ground and I would locate beds in those spots. So that's just what I'm confident in. You can kill deer on the windward side of a ridge. If you want to, I'm just confident on the leeward side. It sets up better for access generally for me. It makes more sense to me. You know, I can pick out a spot on a map and go in there and generally be pretty close to what's actually going on. And uh, it's just what I've, what I found success in. I find more mature deer on that side of the ridge. So what I would tell a new person is, you know, gain some information from guys that you trust or guys that you like listening to and just go put it to work, go put the boots on the ground and, uh, learn as much as possible and keep an open mind. You know, that's going to be a big thing and try not to get too much tunnel vision towards a specific thing, but find confidence in what you're doing and you're going to have success. And I think that's, that's a, that's a very valid point because getting tunnel vision is a very easy thing, especially for somebody that does it all the time, right? You overlook a lot of things. Like I'll be hiking with a buddy of mine, and he'll be like, oh, look at this track over here, or this track over there. And I won't even see it because I'm so tunnel vision on other types of sign that I'm losing and missing out on the little things that I should be picking up because you're so, you're just, you're so used to what you're looking at. You know what I'm saying? I, I kind of doesn't do really it. make sense. No, it makes, it makes all the sense in the world. And I do it all the time and I keep like, you know, I, I talk fast, I walk fast, everything I do is quick in life. And when I get in the woods, what I really try to do is like, I'll set, I'll even set like little goals for myself. Like, Hey, you know, when you get into a good spot, just sit down, take a deep breath, you know, calm down, like let your heart rate come back down and really try to just go slow and dissect it instead of just assuming, you know, what's going on. Don't be cocky, be confident, but do not be cocky with what's going on. And that's, I do it every year. I have to, I have to bring myself back because I'll miss stuff. You know, I miss stuff all the time. And I think that's the joy of doing this is 
there's no rhyme or reason to a lot of it. It's, and you just have to continue to put the work in and put it together. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with you. That's the New Englander in you. Fast paced, oh, quick, yeah. quick, it snappy. <laughs> I know. You're used to that way of life. Now, do you think that that's kind of helped you in your adventure of being in the Midwest, coming from some of the, the Northeast states where things are a little bit different, higher pressure, um, you know, the kind of the craziness, the hustle bustle up here? Yeah, I, I do. And, you know, it's it's different from an outsider coming in, right? Like for me, it's I when I got here, I always heard that there was like a ton of pressure down here. And I came down here and I was like, man, early season, like first off scouting, right? Scouting and shed hunting. I've only ever seen one person in the woods in three years doing either of those. And that's winter scouting, spring scouting, shed hunting, and summer scouting. I've, I've seen one guy. And which in New York, I mean, you're running into people all over the place all the time. You know, you might see a hundred people in the woods in a season. So that was the first thing that was different to me. And then the other, you know, I grew up having to fight against pressure. So I've always been looking for, you know, hunter trash or looking for tree stands or looking for boot prints or looking for the night eyes and that are tacked into the trees or ribbons, you know, <laughs> surveyor tape, anything like I'm, I'm always looking for that because in New York, it's probably an overhunted spot when you find that. And down here, you can pattern a lot of people based off of that. So, you know, a lot of the local pressure is going to be generally close to the road. It's going to be set up for more of like a gun season. It's going to be a lot of ladder stands. And in my experience, if you go up and over a ridge or you go back more than a mile, or you go into like a, you know, like the nook of a corner of the property that maybe has a Creek running through it. And then there's a corner on the other side, it's untouched. I mean, it's just, there's nobody back in those spots. So coming from navigating pressure to coming down here, it's been a lot easier for me to determine, you know, this spot isn't getting hit. And if it is, it's one or two guys in this 5,000 acre chunk. And that's a big deal. I mean, even if they're killers and they kill two bucks, there's more than two good bucks in there. Right. So that helps a lot for sure. I, you know, same thing with Kansas last year, I went out there and day one, there was a lot of pressure, but I'm used to pressure. I've got, right. I've got the pressure thing figured out. So what I did is I quit looking for deer and I started looking for where I didn't think hunters would be. And day two, I ended up killing my buck out there because of that, because I just, everything that I had thought I was going to do out there. I just day one at the end of the day, I said, okay, clean slate, forget about it. It doesn't matter. Look at your map, look at the top 20 spots you picked out and find the one that nobody wants to go to find the one that doesn't set up for a climber doesn't set up for the ladder stand doesn't set up for a decoy guy find that and go hunt it and you're going to be close and it it worked out perfect and and in that hunt you did a ton of running and gunning like doing three sets a day i mean day one was what three or four sets yeah it was three sets so i was basically i got in there actually let me think about this one two day one was actually four different locations I stepped foot on, but I didn't hang in the first spot. Right. Because there was but, already two other or three other guys in there. It was loaded with guys. I mean, it was insane. I went back to grab my waders because the Creek was high and there was uh, just vehicles everywhere in the parking lot. And I was like, what, what is going on here? But it made sense, right? It was, it was standing timber and you could clearly see the funnel. Like as much as I didn't want to admit it to myself that I picked a bad spot, like it, the funnel was there and that's, in my experience, not something you want to look for out there because there will be guys hunting those spots. Cause it's too obvious. Yeah. So, I mean, if you can pick it out on a map in Kansas, there will be somebody there. It seems like, especially second week in November. I mean, that's just, that's when it's going on out there. That's so. when they live for. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yep. So you had done three, three sets, but you just kept running and gunning. Yeah. Basically I would set up and if I didn't like it or if somebody walked in on me, I would just get down and leave. Like I, I wasn't going to battle with people over it. And then a lot of these spots, what these guys would do is they would come in like November 1st and hang a stand and they would only bring one stand, but they would hang it in that spot and they would leave. Well, the majority of hunters out there hunting, like, let's say six to 9 AM. And then they're hunting three to 6 PM. So being a run and gun guy, when you're running around in the middle of the day, getting on these spots, you tend to step on people's toes a little bit where I'd go into an area and there's a 
a stand hung, but I'm not thinking anything about it. And then I set up like a couple hundred yards away. And then the guy walks into that stand. I'm like, darn it. I got, I'm getting down. Like I'm not, I'm not jumping, you know, right into this guy's hunt. Like that's not what I'm about. Or one day I, the day one at the end of the day, I walked back out and there was a guy that was walking out too. And I asked him, I said, Hey, uh, how many days you got left here? And he's like, Oh, you know, we're going to be in town for two or three more days. I was like, it's yours, man. Like I'll, I'll go grab my set and get out of here. I'm not going to once again, step on your toes. I'll go find something else. Like, and the other, there's two sides of that. A, that guy had been hunting that spot for 12 days and hadn't seen anything over a 120. And B, I just, I like getting away from people, I guess that I seem to do better when I do that. It, it, it definitely makes sense because he's been in there stinking it up for 12 days. So why would you want to be in a spot that's like that anyways? Exactly. So, and the other thing I had noticed also with, with your hunting, like you only had set up on one of your sets, two sticks up. Oh yeah. And so the, I, I, it's funny because if you pay attention, like I don't really wear a whole lot of camo very often, especially early season. Like I have Sitka for out West when I go like elk hunting. Cause I like just like Merino layers. So I bought like nice Merino layers for that, that I'll wear when it gets cold because I have them. But early season, I'm wearing like Walmart camo pants and a t-shirt and killing most of these deer. And, you know, I don't paint my face anymore. I don't do any scent control whatsoever besides play the wind. Like generally I'm eating my food on the way there, on the way to the stand. So I don't, I don't do any of that. And I only hunt as high as I need to, you know, I was in Michigan in a swamp two years ago in December after gun season. And I was three feet off the ground in a swamp. The only reason I got off the ground was because I was in waist deep frozen water. So I put my stand on the tree and I climbed onto it without a stick. And I had an opportunity at a really good buck that night like, uh, uh, for Michigan, a beautiful deer. I mean, a really nice buck. And I just, you know, I was a little bit off, but, um, but yeah, you know, I'll hunt a stick high. I'll hunt, I'll put my, I've actually put my platform on the ground on steep Hills a lot, like three inches onto a tree just to have a flat surface to sit on or, or I'll hunt, you know, 22, 24 feet high. If I need to, it's just all situation based. I like to have a setup that allows me to do everything. You know, I run the, uh, Lone Wolf custom gear DS five and I run a saddle that way I can sit in the stand. I prefer to sit down in the stand, but if I get to the tree that I'm like, you know, I, that sets up better for me being on the backside of the tree with a little cover. And I, you know, they're coming from my left and I just hang my bow on the tree right there. And then I can just draw back and shoot. I'll do that. So I just, I try not to leave any holes in the scouting and the setup and anything I'm doing. So, so, but what makes you sit close to the bottom? Like, what are you using to your advantage to be low on the ground? It's all cover based. So if I'm looking at a tree, especially out in Kansas, where it's a lot of like hedgerow and brushy trees and stuff like that. If I'm looking at a tree, you know, I'll get into a spot and I'll say, okay, I think that this deer is going to make it to this point and he's going to be coming from here. And I just want to be able to shoot this. Like if I can shoot this, I don't really care what he can see as long as there's an arrow going through his chest at that point. So I'll look at the setup of where I think I want to be. I'll look at like the wind direction. I'll look at the cover of the tree and the cover in the area. And I'll just kind of determine what I want to do. You know, sometimes I'll base how high I go based off of thermals too, where say you go up higher and your thermals start blowing over the top of the hill a little bit better. Like I'll, I'll play the thermal game a little bit. If it's a, if it's a Creek in a bottom and the Creek is going away from where I think the deer are, I'll try to sit lower. That way my scent gets pulled into that Creek and blown down out of there. Um, but yeah, a lot of it is just based off of cover. I would say that that's my number one thing, but it's only based off cover. If I can shoot the spot I need to shoot. Uh, a lot of times I'll sit in the wide open of like a tree that's wide open and just hope I only see one deer because I'll have good cover like 20 yards out until he, you know, he takes like one step past that tree. Like if you look at my, at the dad's buck video, he was hitting that scrape and he had cover in between me and him. And I mean, I'm in a bare tree. I'm, I was saddle hunting, but I'm still in a tree that has no limbs whatsoever. But as soon as he took one step past where he could see me, he got an arrow through his chest immediately. And that's, that's, that's actually pretty incredible because everybody tries to, pick a, a fork in a tree and get in there or 
you know, like you're not with saddle hunting and mobile hunting. A lot of people, we say that you pick your spot, not your tree. And a lot of guys will go in the woods looking for a tree. I mean, I've had times in mobile hunting where I just can't find the correct spot. And I get so pissed that I'm like, I've already walked through the whole place and I can't find the right spot. So what do you do? You just set up. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, you know, especially getting into a piece of public and, you know, and not knowing what's in there and you're kind of scouting your way in and you're like, well, I've already walked through there and that was the best looking sign. And I didn't find the sign as you went through, you know, or somebody had a tree stand there and it's, so it does get frustrating. So I just wanted to bring it up so that it was to a point that you don't need to get 25 feet up. You don't need to, you know, you have to use everything kind of to your advantage and make it the best that you can. Yeah. You know, my, uh, my brother just started getting into the whole mobile hunting thing. And last year I brought him out and me and him, it was during the rut and we went into a spot that was like a, a perfect hub, really wide bottom, but it was thick and brushy and it had a beaver dam going through it. I mean, gorgeous spot but there was no trees except for this dead like four inch thick tree and i ended up climbing up it and he's like that thing's gonna fall over i was like well at least the ground is soft down here i guess i mean (laughs) me and him got eight feet up in this tree and we both looked like you know two grizzly bears hanging out of this tree but the reason we set up there was the main trail came down it had cover and had cover and then when it hit a scrape wide open shot And so that's the, it's, it's looking for those little things. And it's also not setting expectations where like, I I used to do the same thing. Like I used to hunt with a climber and if I didn't find like the perfect tree, I was hunting a tree more than I was hunting a spot. I really was like, Mm -hmm. if I didn't find the perfect tree, I would just, sometimes I would leave or I would go set up so far out of the game that like, I look back on it. I'm like, man, you missed out on so many opportunities where if you would have just embraced the suck and just decided, you know what, like, yeah, this is going to be uncomfortable. I mean, there's, there's times when you're in a setup that just plain is uncomfortable, right? Like your platforms all crooked and you're tethered off and you got, you know, briars brushing into your back and you're just miserable. And you're like, I barely have a shot, but I really believe this is the spot. And it seems like when you get in those areas, when you get in those trees, that's when you kill. And it, if you talk to like Dan or you talk to like Cody DeQuisto or any of those guys, like when you get in those weird spots and you just do something off the wall, like it, you generally connect, like that's when it's going to happen. And that's when it's fun for me. I don't, I don't want to go out and find the perfect tree necessarily and have the perfect climb and have like this fairy tale hunt. Like I want to go out and I want to fall down a couple of times. I want to get tore up a little bit. I want to just have the darndest time hanging up my stand, you know, which is typical for me anymore. It takes me an hour to hang my stand because I'm in some nasty mess normally. And I'm, you know, you get up there and you're like, well, there's no way that there's a deer within eight miles of me right now because I blew this spot out. And then next thing you know, you hear a crack, a stick crack and you look up and here he comes and you're like, wow, I just, you know, that, that to me is what it's about. That gets my blood pumping. And we call that Trez bloopers because I, I mean, I don't know how I'm not hanging upside down from a tree still because it, everything always sucks for me. You know, it's always the worst spot or it's always, but it works, dude. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But like, and you know, how many times have you sat in the stand and you're like, bro, there's no way in the world that I'm in the right spot, that the, that the deer is, there's definitely not going to come. And then what happens? The deer ends up coming, you know, and it just, you get so frustrated with yourself and I used to be like you. I would just leave. I would get yeah. so upset, and I'd be like, all so right, I'm Trev, out of here. Trev's best hunts always tend to come right after that text message of, man, I can't believe it. I left this at the base of the tree, or I just dropped an arrow, or, you know, something went wrong. This sucks. And then 20 minutes later, be like, oh, just got one. Yeah, like, I, yep. and I've, I've got a thought process there. I feel like you it's, – it's a little crazy, but I feel like – when I get to the point where I'm like, just pushing it to the limit and everything's going wrong. And then like, I get to my breaking point and I, I decide in my head, like, you know what? I'm going one step further. It seems like that one step further, whatever that is, is generally what pays off too. you know, like whether it's you drop something out of a stand or you've had multiple bad sits or whatever, or whatever it is. And you have the, you have the choice where I can go home and sit on the couch and eat chips or I can get my butt out of this stand and go move and make one more set. And you do that. And it's like, bam, yeah, it happened. It almost doesn't make sense. 
we have kind of a saying and we call it, we call it killer's going to kill. And it's, it's exactly that. Like you have to push forward just a little bit extra to make it happen. You have to, you know, you could be at home or you could go home, but you're not going to kill him from the couch. You, you know, you have to go that extra mile to do it because not everybody's going to push forth that effort or embrace that suck to be in the briar bushes. Like you have to just keep pushing and it's going to work. You just have to keep moving forward. And I think a lot of people tend to give them, give up or, or, you know, they're looking for that perfect tree and they're out of it, you know? And it's, I just wanted to kind of bring that up that you don't need that perfect tree all the time. You could, I mean, how many people with a bow and arrow shoot deer from the ground? You don't really even need to get in the tree. I mean, I know a ton of people that are very good ground hunters and they shoot giant bucks from the ground walking around or still hunting or, I mean, especially by us, like, or in the Northeast, like you have all that topography to work with. You have a ton of ridges and valleys and you can definitely move around and definitely kill deer that way for sure. Oh, no doubt. And the other thing too, is I feel like a lot of newer mobile hunters or people that haven't been in the game a long time are really, really hard on themselves. They don't think that they're setting up fast enough. They don't think that they're quiet enough. They don't think that You know, they look at some of these guys on social media and they're like, they go out and have the perfect hunt. Like you have to have the perfect hunt to kill. And I'm here. I I hope that if I ever showcase one thing, it's the fact that I'm a hot mess and just a wreck all the time out in the woods. Like I'm, I'm telling you, I'm falling down. I'm having just the worst time. You can even imagine hanging my stand every time I go, not every time, but a lot of the times, like I try to be as efficient as possible in practice, but you don't plan for that limb or you don't plan for the tree to be just like an inch too big to where you can't get your strap around it or stuff like that. And everybody's going through that. The the guys that are saying they're not are lying to you, plain and simple. The guys that are out there doing it and killing deer are going through the exact same thing. The, the guys that, you know, I've, I've hunted with some of the best hunters out there as far as I'm concerned, and I've seen them do the same stuff. So I, there's no need to get discouraged because it's part of the process. It's part of the game. You want to be safe and you want to have fun, but you need to embrace the fact that it's, it's a little bit out of control. And that's kind of what, that's kind of the joy of it. If you, if you ask me. Oh, absolutely, man. (laughs) There's no doubt about it. And people don't understand. Like my dad would say all the time, if, if somebody said that they hit everything that they shot at, then they're lying to you because we all miss, we all have those, those bad days. We all, you know, people don't showcase that stuff. I don't think, and I don't think that they talk about it enough. Like, like you said, the new guys are coming into it and they think that everything is all rainbows and unicorns because they think that everything is just so easy and they should, it should be so fluent and stuff. Dude, not even close, man. It, I mean, how many times have you gone into a place, uh, say like running and gunning and it's dark And you end up through a briar patch and you're just, you're just getting your ass handed to you (laughs) the whole time. (laughs) You know, you're just like, this sucks, but it, that's the way that it goes. And when you, when you're deer hunting, I mean, that's, that's just inevitable, honestly. Yeah. That's, that's the best part. If you ask me, that's, that's the kind of things that I love, but yeah, you know, if, if anybody was curious of what a real deer hunt looks like a new guy, come hunt with me one time and you'll be like, wow, this is just out of control. Like this guy's a wreck, (laughs) but it works. So, Hey, that's what it works. They'll they'll probably give up. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. My family and my brother and friends all think I'm nuts when they go out with me. They're like, what are we doing here? Like what is happening right now? (laughs) So maybe they think that it's just that luck. You just have luck, like overly luck. You're not good at it. You just have luck. Oh yeah. Yeah. I get that. that's well, crazy i want to segue off that a little bit and kind of switch it back to uh where we're at right now in preparation um i will say deer chores coming up through june what are the things you're going to focus on and really want to do that you would recommend people be doing to prepare for early season so at this point i really hope that the majority of hunters have done some winter scouting and some spring scouting. And, you know, if they're mobile hunters, if they're doing that sort of thing, if they like bed hunting, I hope that they've found a lot of beds already. I hope that they have some food sources, you know, at least picked out that they can check on throughout the year. And I hope they're really thinking about putting cameras out 
Um, because that's what I've done up to this point. You know, I've scouted really hard. Like I said, like probably 300 miles boots on the ground, maybe a little more than that already. Um, you know, I've found a ton of sheds in different areas. I've been going through my trail camera inventory and Intel from the last couple of years. I'm opening up all my different folders and spreadsheets and looking at wind directions and what bucks have been in these areas and what bucks have grown. Last year we had a pretty bad acorn crop down here. I would say the yeah. worst one I've ever seen in the hardwoods. And that threw me off a lot. So I have a lot of Intel that is a little bit different than I would like, but I also have Intel from two years ago. That's going to help me again. So I'm going through all of that and I've, uh, I've already got my camera locations generally picked out where I want to be, but starting next Sunday, it's a matter of actually going out there and, you know, I'm, I've got five or six trips pre-planned. I pre-plan my, my route entirely of where I'm going to go in and do my, you know, 10 mile loops and, uh, get my cameras out. And then it's really for me, a matter of letting those cameras soak until September. That's kind of hard to do, but I like letting them soak. And it's a matter of trusting in the process and doing a little bit of glassing in between, not as much as I used to, because the areas that I'm targeting aren't as conducive for glassing, but I still like to glass some of the areas around here because a buck could pop up at any point in time. Last year, I was glassing a new a spot that I had been in shed hunting and a buck popped up that I was really interested in. So the next weekend I went in there and scouted in the summertime for him and I put out a bunch of cameras. Um, so that's, that's my thought process right now. Now, if you don't have that Intel, if you don't have the beds, if you don't have the scouting done <clears throat> now, now is better than never. Right. So, right. You know, lace up the snake boots, put permethrin on because there's going to be seed ticks out there. Oh yeah. Get a, get a spider stick ready so you can whack spiders as you're walking around <laughs> and, uh, go put boots on the ground and, and do the same thing. You know, I moved down to Ohio June 7th of 2019 and I scouted up until three days before season. And I killed the biggest deer of my life. My second hunt based off of no winter or spring scouting whatsoever. It was just determination boots on the ground and just persistence. Just keep going, keep going, keep going. And I was looking for beds I would go to the top of a lot of these really good ridges and actually wind bump the deer off and glass them so I could see what they looked like. And I would do that multiple times on some of these deer just to try to get a bead on one because I didn't have the intel I needed. So, you know, intel is huge. Having some sort of intel to lead you into season is going to help a lot. And I really, I know that I'll, if people have limited time, People have limited vacation or PTO and they want to use that during the rut. But if you can get the Intel you need, there's no better time to kill a deer than the first week of season. They're still on somewhat of a pattern. And you know, my bread and butter is being the first person to take a shot at that deer. I want to be the first person in that area. The first person that that deer encounters all year. That's my best opportunity after he gets boogered a couple of times by somebody else all your intel is junk at that point. I mean, you're, you're basically starting over it at that point up until, you know, you can pattern him on like a pre-rut, but if you're the first person to take a shot at that deer, you've got, you've got a pretty good opportunity if you have the intel you need. Nice. No, I, I totally agree. I think that's great. Now, are you trying to like, now you, you always talking on scrapes, like you, are you trying to kill them on scrapes or like early season? Like, are they showing up on those communal scrapes early season? Oh yeah. Yeah. So I, it depends on the spot, right? It's situational. Mm -hmm. You know that. Um, but let me think here one. So two out of the, the two deer that I've killed the last three years, over 170 were both on scrapes that were right on food sources. So it was a scrape on a white Oak both times, uh, you know, out of the last 10 years, the majority of deer that I've killed in the first week of season have been on scrapes or at least I've gained Intel off of a scrape or glassing, you know, like back in New York, I'd glass quite a bit and then make a play on a deer based off that. But generally it's going to be off of inventory Intel on a scrape. And if they're hitting that scrape in daylight, that's where I'm probably going to be. If they're not hitting it in daylight is when I'll work, like say the scrapes in the bottom and the bucks on the upper third of the Ridge. If he's coming there an hour after daylight, that's when I'll start working up that Ridge system towards like a secondary food source or maybe a smaller scrape 
to try to make a play on them coming to the community scrape. It just depends on what my cameras are telling me. Absolutely. Now, are you, are you, are you just run those scrapes? Are you just using them naturally? Are you adding any type of scent to them or how do you go about doing that in the early season? So I've ran a, a little bit of mock scrapes in the past. Um, but generally it's natural hub scrapes that have been there for a long time. And, you know, what I'm looking for on a scrape is an area where there's a lot of intersection going on, an area where it's thick enough and conducive enough to have a buck there in daylight, you know, close enough to his bedding. I like to have those scrapes in between the bedding and the food source, if possible, because it just, I'm trying to draw a line, right? Like I'm trying to draw a line and put as many things as possible within that line to give me the best shot. Um, you know, a, a really good hole under the scrape from where it's been dug up and peed in for years and years and years, like the longer, the better, as many branches as possible that are all chewed up and tore up. Like, you know, you're typical, you walk through the woods and you see like this big giant car hood scrape that's all dug up and it's got a bunch of branches. Like that's the kind of scrape I'm looking for in early season. And I have these deer hit these scrapes all year round in the right spots. I mean, every single, you know, every week of every month, I'll have deer hit these spots. Um, but yeah, I, so I haven't ran a ton of mocks. I've ran a, a little bit of mocks in the past, but I am going to start doing that a little bit more and touching them up. Um, I've been talking to Troy Pottinger a lot. If you guys are familiar with him and, uh, he's a killer, you know, he's killing out in the big mountains of Idaho. So I, I like what he's doing. He's running a lot of mock scrapes and he's putting deer, uh, buck fever synthetics in it. And so I got a hold of him and I got some of that. And I'm going to try that a little bit this year to see if that helps out. And I've got areas I won't use it because the scrapes are perfect. You know, they're already getting hit. There's no sense in even intruding in there. Just adding to, right? Yeah. But I do have some areas in some of these spots that I feel like, man, if there was a scrape in this location, like where these three bedding ridges dump down into like this micro hub on the upper third of this hill, and then it drops down to the main one. Like if I can put a scrape there, that's just going to entice those deer to come there a little bit more. And hopefully I get a little bit more inventory of them as well. So it is something I'm going to play off a little bit just to basically my goal is to steer that deer into a killable area. So maybe generally he'd run down the front of a ridge and then go down and it's like, okay, you know, I know this deer's here. He's bedded up here. I can't get within 300 yards of him because it's so wide open. But if I can steer him 50 yards over the point of this ridge, I can work my way up the drainage and get set up over a scrape right here and I can kill him here. So maybe I'm trying to like, you know, just steer them just, just within range of where I can get in and kill that deer. And not, and not booger them up. Exactly. That's kind of crazy. That's so, but to the normal scrapes that are already there, you're not adding anything to them. You're not nope. trying to put a drip on them. You're not trying to do anything. You're just running them 100% natural yeah, and then never. dry never had to they've always especially in ohio they've always been so good that i can't i've been here for three years but in the three years right. they've been right. so good and so patternable that i'm like i don't know i don't know how these have been here and there isn't like five cameras on this thing like how do people walk by this and not see this thing and you know there's not even like other people's drips or anything like that and i'm like it's never been touched by by anybody it's, it's crazy to me. So that's just what I'm focusing on. When you find the right ones, they just, they work. That's awesome. No, that's definitely a, a pretty good tip because a lot of people are so set on doing their own mock scrapes and this and that, but I don't think that, I hope that people take from you kind of where to put a proper mock scrape, because if you just put them anywhere, yeah, they might work, but they're not going to be as effective as being in the exact proper spot of being a mac good like, if you have a property and you just put a mock scrape just anywhere you if you're not going to get the inventory that you need if it's not in the right travel corridor yeah, if those the, deer aren't going the there. tendency from what i've noticed and just watching people around here is they put a mock scrape where they want the deer to be for them people hunt and try to attract them to where they want them to the deer to be as opposed to hunting the deer where the deer is Yes. So they, they think it's going to change a deer's pattern to come to that. And all they're going to do is walk by and go, nah, that's not quite right, and go the other way. So you got to play it in a natural formation. 
Exactly. Yeah. There's a lot that goes into it and it's, to be honest with you, that side of it is definitely going to be an, a growing experience for me and a learning lesson for sure. Um, but there's, there's a lot of good information out there. You know, Troy has put a ton of information out there about him. And I would say that he's probably the, the king of doing mock scrapes. So it's out there. It's just a matter of, once again, you'll learn something from somebody new that kind of interests you. Do you think that you could take maybe even just a segment of what they were talking about and you want to implement it into your own game to help build your game even better? That's the whole point. Right. Absolutely. And Steve, you brought up a very valid point. I think not even just in the scrape aspect of it. I think a lot of people hunt where they want the deer to be, not yes. where the deer want to be. Exactly. You know, and I think that's a huge thing. And I think from listening to Jake, I think people can take a lot of things from that and understand to hunt where the deer want to be, not where they want them to be. I think we all kind of get into that realm sometimes and kind of put it to the wayside where, you know, like, I'm like, this is where I want the deer to come down. Oh, I, and this I was is where I'm going to hunt. Hey, I'm going to park here. I'm going to walk in a hundred <laughs> yards and there's a trail and I'm going to sit up on that trail and those deer are going to come right there. And that's it. I'm done. That's not the case. <laughs> it's not the case. I wish it was that easy. Yeah. And At one thing I've, uh, I've changed a lot throughout the years. You know, when I was younger, I was like really greedy with these spots too. Same thing. I'm like, I want the, you know, I want the deer to be here. But I would pick a spot that has like, let's say five trails intersecting it, but it's out in the open. I'm like, a, a mature buck's never going to go to that. Right. What I really tried to do is get to the point where every hunt, I'm trusting my gut and I'm making a decision to hunt one specific location. Like if there's two, you know, really good trails and they run parallel, I used to want to shoot both of them, right? I was like, where's the narrowest spot? And I want to shoot both of them. But now I tell myself, I think the deer is on, is going to come down this trail because of these factors. I think he's bedded here with this wind and this food source. I'm going to hunt the closest to him that I think he is on this one specific trail. If he comes down the other one, I learned a really valuable lesson and I probably won't make that mistake again, but just stick into your gut making a decision and going for it. Even if you fail, you're going to build up like spidey sense, right? Like that mm -hmm. you start building up that, like instinct and that, that just like, yeah, instinctual, you know, thought process. And I feel like more times than not, the more you do it, the more that's going to be correct. Absolutely. No. And then you're just building your, your dictionary to keep moving on and keep, keep getting yourself going. And then you're going to end up killing that deer. It might not be in the first day, but it could be in the first week. Exactly. So, I know we're kind of winding down, man. What's kind of one of the things that you kind of want everybody who's listening to the podcast to kind of take from it? So I would say that, like we talked about earlier, you know, there's nobody's perfect to this, no matter what kind of uh, face they put on. It's a learning lesson. It's, it's supposed to be fun. Set your own expectations, your own goals. You know, don't, don't, set goals based on what anybody else is doing in any other part of the country or even in your own area. You know, everybody's going to be different. Do it for the right reasons. Have fun doing it. Learn as much as you can. And uh, yeah, just, just have good experiences, you know, go out there and, and figure it out. And yeah, hopefully you kill a good buck. Absolutely, man. And you know, it's, I, I apologize because normally we don't normally do the tips and tactic type podcast that's not really us you know so it's been very good and a little bit different for us um to kind of do a podcast like this normally it's the fun hunting stories on the tailgate you know kind of just telling the old stories and kind of just chewing the fat so it's a little bit different sorry if it's been uh kind of crazy for you but I, we've definitely taken a lot of information from it no it's been good i've i like talking about it as you can tell so <laughs> yeah that's yeah. awesome it's an important thing and especially on the deer hunting side no one's talking tips and tactics now unless you're die hard. But if you're not talking about it and doing it now, it's not going to be ready early season. Most people wait till early season to get caught up. So I think it's a good time to drop the information and get it on people's mind. No, it really is. And, you know, one thing I noticed from doing this over the last couple of years is the closer that we get to season, the more of these podcasts kind of ramp up, right? Like yep. you'll start getting more, you'll start getting more requests and stuff. And I'm sure a lot of that has to do with analytics and, 
when they think there's they're going to have more listeners or anything like that but the gems the the podcasts that are really gems are the ones that are coming out now and the ones that are coming out you know in the spring and then leading into the summer because that's that's when you need to take the information in and apply it it's it's no good if you learn how to you know springtime scout in september really i mean it's it's knocking on the door i'm sure there's there's things to take away from that but they're so much more valuable right now because you still have time to get out there and do everything that we talked about in this podcast. Absolutely. That's the key point. Well, man, our last question of the night is what drives you outdoors, Jake? Who, ha, uh, there's a lot of different things. So I would say I'm going to, I'm going to go to the, on the, on a personal level for me, for like a, it's a challenge. It's something that I'm a very goal oriented person and I really like to set goals and do everything I can to just try to accomplish them. You know, even if it's overboard, which I'm sure a lot of the things that I'm doing, people are looking at and they're like, what are you, what are you doing, man? Like, you don't need to do that. Right. But in my head, I'm like, if, if I work, if I work as hard as I can, whether it's through, you know, scouting or fitness or the mental side of things, if I can like, somehow correlate all of that into this whitetail chase and this pursuit when it happens when i close on that deer after dedicating my whole life to it for 365 days it is like it's like winning the super bowl where if i didn't do all that i might not have that same feeling and i really like that feeling like that is that's that's my high that's what i'm addicted to is that feeling that i get like that triumph right but I need to, I need to push myself to the limits to achieve that triumph. I don't want it to come easy. I don't want it to be something that is ever easy. I want to have to work as hard as I can for the rest of my life to get that, you know, I would say less than 10 minutes of just, you know, after you kill you're you know, you know, I'm talking that about you're hanging out of the tree. Mm -hmm. there, there's nothing like it. You know, your heart rate's just peaked out and your adrenaline's going and you're like, I just accomplished my goal. Like I just, I just, I did it. And there's nothing that's better than that for me. Um, and then on the other side of it, the other thing I really enjoy is kind of broadcasting that passion out to my loved ones. So, you know, my girlfriend, my brothers, my dad, my grandpa that have both passed now, but I've, I've got a lot of family under me that it's something that we've all done together and I'm watching them grow and I'm watching them succeed. You know, my girlfriend shot her first buck last year after passing a couple questionable deer. And, uh, <laughs> I was, I was pumped. I mean, there was, it was one of the best hunts of my life. I watched my brother kill a doe last year with first, first deer with a bow. And, you know, I'd trade my, my buck in last year for his doe all day long because it was such a great experience. So, I've got a couple of different things pulling me different directions, but for me, it's, it's hardcore and you know, that goal and that pursuit. And then I step back after that's done and I just have a really good time with my family. And I try to make as many memories as possible. That's, that's amazing, bro. It, that's it, really is. It, it sounds like regardless, whichever direction you said, it pulls you in different ways, but all those different ways lead you right back outdoors. They do. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's all I know. You know what I mean? It's I based, my whole life around it as a lot of people have where everything just kind of comes back around to that. You know, I will, I will choose my lifestyle in the outdoors over any career. I will choose it over money. I will choose it over anything. As long as my family has enough to be taken care of, that's, that's all that matters to me because this is what it's about. You know, some people are just, some people have that and they're wired a certain way. And I don't know if it comes from, being hunter gatherers or what, but some people got it, you know what I mean? And then mm -hmm. some people don't, and that's perfectly fine. That's, that's 100% okay. It's just, I got it. I got the bug. <laughs> I hear you. We need some people to collect vegetables. It's just the way that it goes. No, <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Hey, I like veggies with my steak. I had uh, a right. salad with my, with my back strap earlier. So. There you go. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's definitely, uh, quite the good situation to have so i can paraphrase here and say that the answer to the question of how you kill big deer early season is you got to be a hot mess that's yes. that's the takeaway 
just be a hot mess <laughs> yeah be a hot mess and that's pretty much it i mean it's a <laughs> it's something outstanding well jake before we let you go where can everybody find you uh, i've got a youtube that has a couple of those hunts on it over the last three years it's legends of the hunt and you guys can find legends of the hunt on instagram or you could find jake bush on instagram or facebook outstanding well guys you know where to find him if you want to be a hot mess too Go follow along and get some tips and tricks along the way. And uh, until then, as always, we want to thank you guys for taking a ride right here on the Outdoor Drive.